chat. Um, homepage editor, I'm well aware that that's one of those jobs that uh, makes some kind of sense to my colleagues, but is totally baffling if you don't work for The Economist. So I'll just tell you what that is. I spend my uh, days at work and my evenings at home sometimes, and my weekends, unfortunately, looking after this page, which is the homepage of The Economist website. I manage a little team uh, around the world who, who do that so that it sort of changes um, all through the day and all through the night and seven days a week and that kind of stuff. Um, you probably know The Economist as a weekly magazine. This is a big part of what we do now. We have eight million unique users a month on the web. Um, between them, they generate about 40 million page views. Uh, so this started as a kind of sort of bolt-on thing, but now it's pretty central to what we do. Um, the Economist, as you may have noted, is not, in fact, a think tank, so I feel like a bit of an imposter here. But I think perhaps that some of the things that we're trying to figure out are also things that you're figuring out, like how you communicate complex ideas uh, on digital platforms in a world where there seems to be a kind of huge amount of noise uh, and where people who shout the loudest often, often tend to get rewarded. Um, for that very reason, the web, when it first became you know, sort of a big thing, about 15 years ago, I suppose, often looked like an opportunity to us, but felt a bit more like a threat or, or a challenge. I mean, uh, for the think tanks, it's fantastic. As, as you, you have both described, it sort of turns you into media organizations in a sense. You're able to communicate directly with people who uh, are interested in the research you might be providing. For us, you know, th the same is true. Uh, it's great for building audience, but as you know, the Guardian and, and others have found out, it's a huge business challenge. And Richard showed some of the data on, on newspaper circulations. Um, so The Economist is not alone in uh, being a bit baffled as to how to present itself digitally. Uh, and as a result of that, when the web came along, we sort of rather tiptoed in, which it turned out uh, was a brilliant strategy. <laughs> Uh, we didn't spend a huge amount of money hiring people to do web-only jobs. We didn't get ourselves in a Guardian-style conundrum whereby the sort of success online, huge numbers of uh, readers and paid views meant you had to hire more and more people, which in turn you know, raised your cost base, made it harder and harder for you to make money, uh, and you ended up in this kind of strange situation that all the traditional media who went for the free model have found themselves in, which is that you know, they've got this kind of great success and fantastic reach, and you hear people from those organizations talk, and they tell you how many unique users they have and how fantastic it is, but they also lose money hand over fist and uh, are cross-subsidized by um, you know, their sort of the dying print bit of the business. So, so we didn't do that. Um, we just had a web page which was basically a list of what was in this week's Economist uh, for the first bit, and then we started to get a little bit more webby we started to produce bits of daily analysis on sort of the thing that's in the news today. So today it might have been, you know, Syria's use of chemical weapons. We'd have one new piece up every day that felt very webby and very fast for us. Um, and we continued doing that for a little while. I don't think it was entirely satisfactory because it was sort of neither the kind of slow journalism that we do in the paper, um, by which I don't mean that it's, you know, slow to respond to things. I mean that it, you know, we take a long time to do our reporting. Our writers have a decent amount of time to write. We're not trying to hit um, impossibly tight deadlines all the time. Um, it was neither that, nor was it kind of very fast, instant uh, response stuff of the type that often goes down on, on the web. Um, so about three years ago, when I started doing this job, uh, we started blogging in, in a major way. Uh, and we figured that actually, the nice thing about blogs is they're kind of like what The Economist does anyway. You take, uh, you, you take sort of subject specialists uh, who, hey, that's not, oh, Boggs. <laughs> that's, sort of, uh, that's sort of poetic, isn't it? <laughs> Hopefully not. Anyway, we have all of our reporters blogging away on our various blogs. Um, this sort of started from, from sort of nothing a few years ago, and now we have 23 of these blogs. Uh, on separate subjects. Um, so that top one, game theory, is a kind of new departure for us. That's a blog about sports, but a, but a very kind of wonky one. It looks at statistics and data and that kind of thing. So it's a slightly economist to take on that. Uh, Buttonwood's Notebook, that's our chief financial markets guy who you know, kind of blogs about what's going on in financial markets. Schumpeter is uh, some, you know, some more business and finance. 
Um, there's a new blog we just launched called The Economist Explains, where we sort of Huffington Postify our own content and take a question every day and try and answer it in four paragraphs, linking to a whole load of our stuff. Anyway, you kind of get the idea. We do uh, a lot of this stuff uh, now, and um, uh, and we did used to worry a lot about you know what what's a weekly like us that's been producing sort of thoughtful print journalism for 150 years. What do, you know? What do we do on the web? Um, and the answer, I think, is that uh, we do exactly the same as we do in our weekly print cycle. We try and write stuff that's, that's informed, that's argumentative. Um, it turns out that the sort of tone that is pretty much standard on all blogs, which is one of sort of slightly, uh, it rewards being slightly contrarian, being slightly argumentative, um, having sort of killer facts which can debunk some opponent's argument, is actually the sort of stuff that The Economist is filled with anyway. You know, we've always mixed um, reporting and comment. So that, having thought that this was a kind of terrible thing, um, it, uh, it turns out that it's sort of what we were doing anyway. Um, we don't, as I say, we didn't hire any kind of special people to do all this stuff. This is all something that our reporters do uh, in and around their, their normal jobs. Um, I occasionally have to sort of beat them over the head with a stick to make sure that they blog. But most of the time, you know, they're reporters. Uh, they get pretty excited when a big news story breaks on their patch, much in the way I imagine that some of your area specialists at think tanks might get very excited if, you know, your health specialist might get very excited if there's a big health story. You, I tend to find, you know, I'm sure everyone has their own way of doing these things, but if you kind of work with people's interests internally, you tend to get better results than if you kind of force them to do stuff that they don't want to do anyway. Um, so, so those are our blogs. As I say, our you know, it, we've gone from having a web page which just listed The Economist's uh, weekly content to something that gets, you know, 40 million page views a month. We have a paywall, so our, uh, I know you guys probably don't have to think about this as much because you're all about, you know, getting your stuff out there. For us, getting our stuff out there is fine, but what we ideally want to do is persuade some of those people who might be uh, reading us on an on the web to ultimately uh, to subscribe so we can um, keep our business going. So how do we do that? Well, we've come up with a few kind of web-specific things. Uh, some of them, obviously, you know, are blogs, but then we've also got some things which I suppose you could copy uh, if you felt so inclined. One of which is our daily chart, which, uh, I'm hoping I'll find an example here on the left hand. Rail. No, I can't. Oh, yeah, there we go. Okay. This is slightly, actually, this is a report that was a couple of days old. But what we tend to do, uh, and this is one of our kind of popular features online, every day we find an interesting bit of data. Uh, we put a paragraph of text together and, uh, and then produce the chart kind of in the economist style. And we tweet that like crazy and push it out. And it's a very uh, nice way for people to get a kind of bite size uh, feel for what the economist does and then. And then they occasionally weigh in on comments threads. Oh, yeah, there we go. The nice thing we found is our comments threads are actually pretty, uh, pretty sort of rational and, and, and well informed. <laughs> this is not always the case with newspaper comment threads. But I suspect that I don't know how many of you guys it's the opposite have of your comment is free. It's the opposite <laughs> of comment is free. Um, I don't know how many of you guys have sort of comment threads uh, on your sites. What we've tended to find is the wonkier the subject, the higher the quality of, of comments, uh, which sort of plays to, the, to our strengths and I suspect would, would play to yours as well. You would tend not to get um, completely crazy comments if you're producing a report about nutrition in Malawi because the chances are you'll get, you know, okay, maybe a relatively small number of people, but they may actually know something. And, and so the comments threads can actually add, add something rather than um, being a sort of shouting match and a general distraction and a, a reflection of all that's worst in humanity. Um, so we do that. Uh, we also do some stuff which, again, all you guys will be doing as well, uh, or at least you'll be thinking about doing, uh, video, audio. Um, one of the odd things about the web, of course, is that it turns all me media organizations into sort of each other's competitors. So we used never really to think of ourselves as competing with people who produced audio or video um, you know, like the, the BBC or Sky or whoever, but as soon as you're reading the web on your smartphone, 
suddenly, as a consumer, you have a choice. Well, do I want to go and listen to Radio 4 or do I want to check out some podcast from The New Yorker, uh, which is quite a sort of strange universe. Uh, what we found works well for us in multimedia, we do produce lots of videos, uh, but what works really well is audio. It's extremely low cost to make, and even small think tanks with small budgets uh, can afford a flash mic. You can get an expert in on a particular subject area, quiz them, turn it into a podcast. It's very, very easy, uh, and people can listen to it while they're going jogging or doing cooking or, or whatever, uh, and that's a sort of great thing. We found, weirdly, through um, downloads on iTunes and then sort of web radio services like SoundCloud and things like that, that The Economist, in, in some people's minds, is sort of becoming a radio station, which is not something we thought would ever happen. But we have huge numbers of people listening to the print edition uh, in audio form. We get, on a Thursday, we get a team of actors to read uh, the whole of The Economist in, in beautiful sort of Oxford English accents, <laughs> uh, which our American readers like very much. And it's remarkable how many people listen to The Economist now rather than download it. Um, I guess there was some kind of strategy behind that way, way uh, back in the sort of dawn of the web. But what's happened for us, which I'm sure is the case for all of you, is you try a whole load of things. Some of them stick, some of them don't. Uh, the great thing about the web is that if anything doesn't stick, you can just kill it off uh, instantly. So we've, as I say, we have 23 blogs now. Um, we've already killed off a few that just didn't really work. You know, the authors got very excited about them initially, and then after two months, there weren't enough posts, and they were kind of flagging. So you just hit a kill switch, and it's just as easy to start up new ones, which is, which is great. Um, Another thing that I, we pay some attention to now that we didn't used to, of course, is social media. We have done really, really well on social media, and that came as a bit of a surprise to us. Um, we didn't have anybody sort of thinking great thoughts about social media strategy. It just kind of happened, uh, and now we take it seriously uh, as a result because we kind of have to. We have 3.1 million followers on Twitter for our corporate um, uh, f uh, you know, kind of sort of Twitter feeds. Um, that's you know not including the economist journalists individually who all have you know decent followings. Um, I think we're way ahead of any other news organisation in the UK in terms of that. Um, we have one and a half million fans on Facebook. Um, it sort of goes on and on and on. Um, and I think the reason that people that we've done well on social media is that people who read the Economist really like it and quite want to sort of shout about that. And again, I suspect that's sort of analogous to. To, to some of the things that you guys are doing, in the sense that if you are you know, a development person who cares uh, deeply about hungry people in Asia, the chances are you're going to be quite happy to shout about the fact that you follow the ODI or that you, you know, like something that they've put on their Facebook page. Um, I, I suspect that one thing that's true about social media, there's a lot of things a lot of nonsense talked about social media. One, one thing that's true is you can't really steer it, right? You, you kind of have to just see what people uh, do with your stuff and then try and work with that grain rather than, rather than against it. So now we do have lots of people, well, lots of people, a small team of people um, engaged full time in social media. But that was only after we could see that it kind of worked for us. Um, I don't think it would have worked if somebody five, six years ago had sat down and said, right, we're going to get to 3.2 million followers on Twitter and this is how we're going to do it. Um, it's just not really how it works. The final bit of my kind of trot through uh, what The Economist is doing digitally, I suppose, is, is um, you know, tablets, apps. Uh, this is probably less relevant for, for you guys. I imagine that when you're looking at getting people to consume uh, your research or, or getting involved in debates, actually a web platform does it for you for you fine. Um, the web is, is good for us, uh, but I better for us uh, because it's really very close to the business we've always been in, is apps on iPhones, on you know, Android, uh, on all the tablets. Uh, because they, there you can basically deliver people um, the Economist Weekly magazine in pretty much identical format to, to the print edition. Um, that's been a great, great thing for us, and our digital subscriptions are growing quite fast as a result. Um, and what we're discovering, uh, rather as Richard said, is that you, you don't need to forget everything that you knew. I mean, what we deliver uh, on our apps, which is 
really the bit of the business digitally that sort of makes us money at the moment and, and that is that we're kind of most excited about is exactly what we've been doing uh, in the economist for for 150 years you know it's it's the same as the print edition there, there are no additions you know no changes people don't have to rely on postal services in Brazil to get it which is great you know we used to have this huge problem of um, you know it takes some countries a week to deliver the economist by which time it's it's um, not exactly out of date but it's not sort of box fresh uh, the apps are a way to get around that um, they're also interestingly kind of a way to get around censorship we have a problem uh, in India at the moment which is whenever we publish a map of India in the print edition uh, somebody in the Indian customs services impounds all our copies and hand stamps each one saying this a map of Kashmir is not an accurate reflection of the political situation in India. Mm -hmm. And that, as you can imagine, causes some, some delay to, <laughs> our, uh, to our distribution. Um, uh, with, with the apps, of course, you don't have that. So, so that's great. Um, I don't know how relevant that, you know, the apps stuff will be to you guys, but I'm very happy to take any questions about that if you're, you know, if you're thinking about sort of developing apps. Though I'm less of a sort of tech person, more of a journalist. I've been a reporter at The Economist for 10 years, so that's my background. Um, I'm going to talk very, very quickly, because I was asked to, about data uh, on, on the web. Um, one way, I think, to cut through a lot of the noise and to win arguments is with neat bits of data. Uh, we have our <coughs> daily chart, which is a, you know, which is a kind of big deal for us, uh, and we spend quite a lot of time thinking about that. Um, I run a little team that puts that together every day. But then, of course, the web has allowed us to do kind of all singing, all dancing sort of data things that we, that we didn't used to do. Um, oop, uh, okay. One of the things that The Economist has done for a little while is put together a Big Mac index. Uh, this shows the costs of a Big Mac in different countries. And the kind of economic theory behind it is that the inputs of a Big Mac, so the bread and the meat and the lettuce and so on, are roughly equal in different parts of the world. You know, they might vary by a bit, but not by a crazy amount. And therefore, the cost of a Big Mac in any country is quite a good indicator, uh, if you compare it with other countries, of whether a particular currency is overvalued. It kind of started as a bit of a joke. Uh, but now, weirdly enough, uh, in the financial markets, people build what the Big Mac index is saying into various kind of derivatives contracts <laughs> worth yeah. billions of pounds, which is a little scary. <laughs> and also perhaps goes to show that an economics joke is never very funny. <laughs> uh, but so here you have it. This used to be just a, a table in the back of The Economist that said what a Big Mac cost in Argentina or whatever. And now... We, by the way, with this, we, um, we got as much data as we could, and then we kind of crowdsourced some, which, which, was, which was neat. So um, this suggests that, if in Big Mac terms, the most overvalued currency in the world, at least when this was updated in, in January 2013, was the Venezuelan Bolivar, followed by Norway. You know, this, this kind of makes sense with what we know of the world, right? These are both big oil producers, um, uh, and you can kind of, you can do all sorts of fun things with this. You can click on Venezuela and see what the Big Mac index, oh look, it's been getting, it's, you can see it relative to various other countries uh, and you can see uh, all sorts of kind of jazzy stuff. Oh, sorry, I need to talk into my <laughs> microphone. Uh, so that's an example of, of some of the kind of stuff that you can do with data uh, online. I mean, there are, I guess there are sort of two things here. One is the how do you cut through all the noise? You probably don't do it with this, right? What we do is kind of we tweet interesting facts that our, our reporters have, have ferreted out. Like, for instance, we had a report last week on inflation in Brazil, uh, where I used to live, so it's particularly close to my heart. Inflation is picked up in Brazil, and uh, one uh, curious side effect of this is that people are smuggling tomatoes uh, across into Brazil from Paraguay and Argentina along with kind of drugs and, and various other kind of things because the cost of tomatoes is increasing so fast in Brazil. Those kind of facts sort of win you arguments or can kind of pique people's interest. And then you have your kind of library bits of data, um, something sort of Nick was, was talking about, which sit there. Um, we have a few of these things. Uh, people can go and uh, if they want to see what the Big Mac index is saying, they can go online and find it. And it's a far superior version to... 
the old version, which was just a sort of static table. Um, I ca can I show one more example? And then Lee, I know you, you guys want to ask some questions. Um, so this is a fun thing we did. I'm particularly pleased with it because I came up with it. Uh, this is a thing called the shoe throwers index. Um, this is more a sort of uh, uh, return the shoe throwers. Okay. Well, uh, this should be it. Oh, I'm hoping this is the interactive version. Oh yeah, here we go. So when the Arab Spring started, uh, we our, our research department sat down and started thinking about what sorts of factors are involved when you get a revolution. And we started thinking, well, you know, it helps if you've got a really old, uh, ideally autocratic ruler who's been there for a very long time. People are kind of fed up with him. It is normally him, unfortunately. And, um, uh, you know, and he's kind of out of touch. It, it probably helps if you've got a big youth bulge, you know, lots of kind of cross, angry young people without kids who don't feel like it's risking too much to turn up in Tahrir Square and protest even if they might get shot at by uh, soldiers. Um, it probably helps if there's unemployment. You know, youth unemployment um, obviously means that those young people are going to be more and more angry. So anyway, we kind of thought to ourselves, well, maybe we could, maybe there's an index here. And we called it the Shoe Throwers Index. And we plugged, we got a hold of all the kind of data that we could. Obviously, there are some things you can't get data on. Uh, and we put it together and we kind of gave it a, a weighting, various weightings. So you can see these are the kind of weightings we did our, we gave the preset, you know, years in power was 15%, youth bulge 35%, quite a big weighting. And we plugged it in. And this is, by the way, this is, you know, this was before any of these governments had fallen. Uh, and, uh, and it kind of came out with this. So we thought, oh, well, that's kind of interesting. We plugged it out there. It got a lot of pickup. Um, partly because, you know, a lot of these governments, the, the ru rulers started, um, started falling quite fast. And so we had to update it and kind of scrub these people, scrub these people out. Um, then our second iteration, which is this, uh, we put it online. We kind of showed our workings, you know, with the weightings. Uh, and then we put these sliders in, uh, which allowed people to say, no, actually, I think um, the youth bulge thing is not important at all. So I'm going to reduce the weighting on that. And then... Uh, you know, the index uh, calculates that, recalculates it, and you get, uh, you know, you get your new index. Um, I think people quite enjoyed playing around with this. And again, it's one of these things that uh, is fun because it's kind of, uh, it's collaborative. It's us saying in the first iteration, you know, this is what we think is going on here. Here's our stab at explaining it using data. Do feel free to kind of play around and tell us what you think is wrong. Um, this is all done on HTML5. One of the big sort of tech innovations we've had recently is that all our stuff has moved from um, Flash to HTML5. So we now have various people. We haven't hired any new ones, but everyone's had to learn in the kind of research department and in the graphics department how to write HTML5, which is a pain. Um, that is a very, very, very quick trot through what The Economist does online. Um, I'm looking at my watch. I think I've stuck to my 10 minutes. Please ask me any questions about that or The Economist or what's in the news or being, I used to be a political correspondent in Westminster. I'm happy to talk about that. Over to you, Leonora. Fantastic. Thank you very much, John. Prizes for sticking to your 10 minutes. Okay, we've got, um, I'm sure there's a lot of people who've got questions in the room. We're also taking questions via the online chat room and you may be interested to know we're trending on Twitter. We're spot two on the trending list in London. So, um, I'm going to just put the first question, which is one that I had, but also it is coming in through um, the, the online uh, different place, I think ma mainly through the chat room. Um, and then I'm going to take questions in threes. So, um, uh, and when you uh, ask your question, please say your name and the organisation you're from.